I'm completely delighted to be chairing the session on pain and sharing some of the insights from our pain community with all of our friends and colleagues um, across neuroscience. So first up is um, Anina Schmidt, who is an associate professor in the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences and a Welcome Career Development Fellow. She's previously trained in Switzerland and Australia, and today she's going to be telling us about bridging the gap and how she can use translational sciences to improve our understanding of neuropathic pain. So very much looking forward to hearing your talk, Nina, um, over the next 20 minutes. Afterwards, there'll be an opportunity for a few questions. Over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I will just um, screen share. So I hope you can see my screen now. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for letting me present some of our work today on bridging the gap using translational sciences to improve our standing of um, neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is caused by a lesion or a disease of the somatosensory nervous system, and it affects up to 10% of the general population. It is well established that neuropathic pain leads to more severe impact than nociceptive pain. For instance, higher pain severity, reduced quality of life, reduced emotional well-being, and increased healthcare use. The challenges of neuropathic pain are mainly the inadequacies of its treatments. For instance, currently used neuropathic pain drug only have limited efficacy. So for example, numbers needed to trade for commonly used neuropathic pain drugs are between six to 10, meaning that up to 10 people have to be treated with the drug so that one of them, only one of them, has a clinical benefit. Also quite often, these treatments have unacceptable side effects, which often lead to early termination of treatments. Now drug development is mainly based on in vivo models and there's arguably low translation to clinics. For instance, if a drug makes it from preclinics to clinical stage, then first in man to registration success is only 17%. It has been argued that the validity of the animal models might be a barrier to this translation. And indeed, most models induce an acute and a severe injury, whereas most patients with neuropathic pain have slowly developing and chronic neuropathic pain. So therefore it is not surprising that it has been, uh, there have been growing calls for direct target discovery in humans. My group uses carpal tunnel syndrome as a human model system, not only because it's the most common type of neuropathic pain, but also because it has the advantage that it is one of the few neuropathic pain conditions that can be surgically treated. And therefore, it allows us to study um, the pattern mechanisms during the active stage of the disease all the way towards recovery. And now I would like to show you two examples how we have used carpal tunnel syndrome to translate preclinical findings related to nerve injury and neuropathic pain to humans. First of all, I would like to say that our animal model that we work with reflects a slowly developing and chronic compression neuropathy rather than an acute injury model. And there were two features that were dominant in our preclinical model. First of all, there was a prefer preferential small fiber degeneration. As you can see here, um, axons were largely spared in the peripheral nerve. However, at the level of the dorsal ganglia in sensory afferent cell bodies, there was an upregulation of ATF3, which is a marker of axonal damage. And this was predominantly in these very small diameter neurons, suggesting that something happens very early on to these small fibers. And the second finding was that despite the mild nature of this model, there were clear signs of neuroinflammation with activation of immune cells such as macrophages here at the lesion site, but also satellite glial cells at the level of the dorsal root ganglia. Now, I would like to show you now how we use carpal tunnel syndrome as a, in a prospective way to translate these findings to humans. And our prospective carpal tunnel syndrome cohort is deeply phenotyped before surgery, and then again, six months after surgery. The deep phenotyping involves quite a lot of different measures. Amongst them are validated questionnaires for symptoms and function, electrodiagnostic testing, quantitative sensory testing, MRI scanning, 
as well as biosample analyses. And today specifically, I will show you some of the data on human blood and skin biopsies. Now let's go though to the first story about small fiber degeneration that we found in the preclinical model. And we asked the question, is that really true in humans? And to answer that question, we took skin biopsies in the median nerve territory of the affected hand here in the index finger. Now for us, skin biopsies are like a window into the nervous system because we cannot take the nerve out ethically in these patients. But we do know that most of the nerve fibers that are affected in the carpal tunnel end up in the skin um, in, in that median nerve territory. So here you can see a cross section of the skin with the epidermal layer on the top and the dermal layer on the bottom. And in red are the axons and you can see very many um, axons penetrating into that epidermal layer of the skin. Now these are all small fibers and therefore we can basically count how many small fibers do people have in their skin. And you can clearly see that this patient with carpal tunnel syndrome has almost no small fibers left in the index finger skin. And when we quantify that, we confirmed that there was a significant structural degeneration of small fibers in the skin in patients with carpal tunnel syndrome, which by the way, was completely independent of electrodiagnostic testing, which is the standard test that we use to diagnose these patients, but only focuses on large myelinated fibers. Because to date, we thought that um, carpal tunnel syndrome and entrapment neuropathies are predominant large fiber problems. But this data basically shows otherwise. This data then led us to ask the next question, which is, can small fibers regenerate? And to study that, we looked prospectively at skin biopsies taken before and after surgery. And again, here you can see this reduction of intraepidermal nerve fibers pre-surgery and an increase post-surgery. However, you can see that the fibers fail to reach normal levels seen in healthy volunteers. What we also found is that the extent of regeneration positively correlated with symptoms improvement. Now, this is interesting, but of course doesn't mean there is causation. What is, however, much more interesting to us is that there was a substantial spread in the regenerative capacity in different individuals. And that led us to ask the next question, which was, is there a molecular signature in the skin that might explain why some patients regenerate better than others? So we performed RNA sequences, it, sequencing in skin biopsies before and after surgery. And we found here in the volcano plot that ATKIAP1 was the most differentially expressed gene. ATKIAP1 was also associated with small fiber regeneration in the skin. And we found PACAP, which is expressed by ATKIAP1, expressed inside human sensory skin afferents. So again, making PACAP quite an interesting target for us in terms of human nerve regeneration. Now, what is PACAP? PACAP is pituitary adenylate cyclase activating peptide. It is a secreted protein and it acts mainly on PAC1 receptors, but also with lower affinity to VPAC1 and VPAC2. What caught our attention was that this peptide has previously been implicated with neurite outgrowth in monkey trigeminal nerve cultures. However, its action on human sensory neurons has never been studied. So this is exactly what we did now, but this time we back translated the findings from our human model system back into the dish. And what we basically did is that we um, cultured human induced pluripotent stem cell derived sensory neurons in the dish. We kind of lifted them off um, the plate and replated them to induce an axonal injury. And we then had several conditions to see how well do these neurons regenerate and sprout their axons. Here you can see neurons that received vehicle and here neurons that received PACAP. And I believe it's clear to you that the PACAP induced a, a much more stronger neurite outgrowth, which was dose respondent. Here you can see the more PACAP we were giving, the more neurite outgrowth we had. And we also found that giving the PAC1 agonist, so the PACAP receptor agonist, 
um, induced a similar kind of neurite outgrowth as giving PACA. So this suggests that PACAP, as well as its receptor PAC1, are probably interesting therapeutic targets for human sensory nerve regeneration. Now in summary for this first part, our preclinical evidence of small fiber degeneration was replicated in patients using carpal tunnel syndrome as a model system. We did show that human small fibers regenerate, however, only partly and that this regeneration was associated with ATCAP1 in vivo. And PACAP expressed by ATCAP1 facilitates human sensory nerve regeneration in vitro. Now this forward and backwards translation clearly identifies PACAP as an interesting target in human sensory nerve regeneration. Now, let me show you how we translating the finding of inflammation into a clinical treatment for patients. And that is now a slightly different translation, whereas the first one was very molecular based. This is now a very clinical story. Now, so we know there is inflammation in the preclinical model system that seems to be important for the maintenance of that neuropathic pain after nerve compression. But studying neuroinflammation in humans remains challenging, again, because we don't have easy access to intraneural tissues. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I just had a connection issue and therefore missed the end part of your talk. Um, so very sorry about that. Um, thank you ever so much, Anina. Um, the, so, sorry. Um, I just quickly say I was also um, thrown out of the Zoom. Um, oh. So I'm wondering whether it happens to everyone. <laughs> Then can you restart? Because I thought I had just potentially missed it. But if this is across the board, do you mind? Um... Yeah, I will just restart if that is OK, the second part. Um, yeah. So, Christina, we had just heard about how you were just about to tell us a clinical story about inflammation. Yeah. And we were in, all in great suspense about uh, what's going to go. Apologies. So we, have, we must have been thrown out at the same time, uh, Rebecca. That um, me feel a lot better. <laughs> Please <don't. laughs> So I hope you can see this story again. So this is the very clinical story. And um, inflammation was present indeed in the preclinical model um, system. Now, 
Um, inflammation is very difficult to study in humans um, in the nervous system because obviously we don't have easy access to, to human nerves. But a lot of people study inflammation at the systemic level, um, specifically um, in the blood. And I would like to show you the data from our student. Well, he's not a student anymore. He's Oliver Sandy Hindmart, who just finished um, his PhD with us. And he looked at blood pre and post surgery in patients with carpal tunnel syndrome. And indeed, he found several cytokines differentially expressed. One of the interesting ones is IL-9, which he found upregulated in the recovery phase uh, after surgery. And this was also replicated at protein level, as you can see here, where it even correlated with the extent of neuropathic pain. So that makes IL-9 a very interesting target for the pro-resolution phase um, after neuropathic pain. But we were more interested then to look intraneurally. So intraneurally, what we did is we, we took a correlate, which is MRI. Now in MRI and in specifically T2-weighted imaging, increased signal intensity means more water content, which means edema. And basically um, what we found, and many others have also found that, is an increased signal intensity of the median nerve in the tunnel which has then been inter interpreted as a clinical correlate of inflammation. So we were then asking the question, can we now see whether specific treatments can mechanistically reduce that signal intensity of the median nerve? And we specifically used physiotherapy simply because that is the first line treatment for these patients conservatively, but also because I have a passion for physiotherapy having trained um, uh, as a physiotherapist in my first life. Um, and we did basically, we looked at splinting and the exercises and the simple answer is indeed both exercising and splinting can reduce the signal intensity of the median nerve in the carpal tunnel. Um, and therefore that gives us me mechanistic evidence of their effect. But the question is, are these treatments really effective on patient outcomes? And to answer this question, we performed a multi-centered trial, which was coordinated by my student, Karina Lewis. And we randomly allocated patients who were already on a surgical wait list for carpal tunnel syndrome into standard care or education splinting and exercising. So the education splinting and exercise group was a very low cost intervention based on a group intervention, a one-off session, as well as a home program. And we followed these patients six weeks and six months after, um, uh, after randomization. So here you can see the primary outcome measure, which was conversion to surgery. And indeed, this low-cost education splinting and exercise intervention group could reduce the need for surgery by 21%. Now, you might say this is, uh, this is obviously not a cure for all patients, but a 21% reduction in surgery wait list for the most common upper limb surgery will free up some much needed surgery time for those patients who more urgently need it. And we also found that the education splinting and exercise um, group had an increased patient satisfaction. So it is important to patients. Now, this model of care has already been implemented in healthcare settings internationally. And as a summary, therefore, I would like to highlight that where we found inflammation to play an important role in preclinical animal models, we could um, find a correlate in humans in terms of MRI, which could detect higher signal. And we then subsequently showed that physiotherapy can reduce conversion to carpal tunnel surgery by 21% taking our findings all the way from the preclinical um, work to clinics. So I hope I could show you two examples of how backwards and forwards translation between preclinical in vivo and in vitro studies, as well as human research, can facilitate target discovery, such in the case of PACAP and nerve regeneration, but can also inform the design of interventions that can then be studied in large-scale human trials. Such integration of preclinical and clinical sciences is certainly gaining much more attention and I believe will help us to overcome some of the challenges with poor translation faced in pain research. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that um, 
lovely talk, Anina. We um, do have time for um, a question. And so when you went from your preclinical model to your human clinical model, was it difficult to select the approach you used, um, um, namely the MRI edema model? Um, and did you have to rule out many other options? Or was that just very obviously the most direct way to translate your work? Yeah, so that's a, a very interesting question. And I would say it's actually probably it's probably an indirect way, the MRI studies that we did, because indeed imaging inflammation is very tricky to do. Um, and, and uh, you know, people have used, for example, combined MRI and PET scanning and, and have shown uh, kind of with markers that bind to um, glial cells, for instance, and have shown increased uptake of this marker after certain nerve injuries. However, in, in MRI and PET scanning is not very clinically applicable. And we were mainly interested in a simple kind of clinical tool that we could potentially in the future use for patient stratification as well. And that's why we went, went for, for, um, for structural MRI, really. Um, okay. So we've got one more question from Zamil Kadir. Um, she said it was a great talk, and thank you very much, um, and wants to know whether NGF is important, or she notes that NGF is important in osteoarthritis pain, and do you think PACAP might have, have a role there too? Uh, in osteoarthritis pain. So it has not been, uh, to my knowledge, PACAP has not be, really been looked at in osteoarthritis pain, unless I might have missed something. Um, but um, Sam would probably be the right person to answer that question because it has been um, really looked at um, quite well in migraine. Uh, in fact, though, in migraine, they try to block PACAP, whereas we show that, you know, for, for a neuronal um, kind of regeneration, it seems to be more important to activate it. And it will be very interesting to see whether the blocking of PACAP that is now kind of in, in clinical trials for human um, uh, studies um, will have a problem in terms of, you know, if you think about nerve regeneration or not. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be familiar specifically in osteoarthritis pain and, and PACAP. Yeah. That's great. So um, do you keep the questions coming in so we can keep this interactive? Um, thank you very much. So I'm now um, incredibly pleased to introduce Ben Seymour. Um, he joined the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences last year and is both a senior welcome fellow and a consultant neurologist. He um, works jointly across the WIN and in biomedical engineering while somehow managing to also keep a research program up and running in Japan. So he's going to tell us about unraveling pain in the brain, a topic in which I have a deep personal interest. So now over to you, Ben, to the next 20 minutes. Okay, great. Um, let me just work out how to share my um, screen. Okay, can you, can you see that okay, everyone? We can see it, thank you. Super. Okay, yes, yeah, so thanks very much, and it's, um, it's a, a great pleasure and honour to join everyone here today. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about unravelling pain in the brain, and I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm a clinician, and often meetings about pain are, uh, are very dominated by the, by the clinical story. Um, but I sort of want to take a, um, a few minutes just to kind of remind people that actually pain is very interesting just from a basic neuroscience perspective. Um, not just from a clinical perspective, and I hope I won't be thrown out of the NHS for, um, for saying that. But I'll start with three perspectives, which I think captures, I think, what makes pain so fascinating. And the first is that it's a really fascinating philosophical problem. And there is an argument to be, a case to be made um, <clears throat> that uh, pain was probably the first thing we ever felt when we evolved consciousness in animals. Um, it's difficult to prove that, but there's something, there's something really fundamental about, um, about pain. Um, you can certainly argue that it's a pinnacle of phenomenal consciousness, the most intense, the most, um, the most um, um, kind of invigorating thing that we, um, that we feel. But yet it's kind of almost you know, indescribable. It's private, it's self-intimating, it's incorrigible. If we feel pain, we are in pain. That's not, you know, no one can deny that. Um, but, you know, as Virginia Woolf um, said, you know, for pain, words are lacking. It seems to lie underneath, you know, our very sort of ability to, de to, uh, to describe it. And in a, one of my favorite poems, joy is a shell, but pain is the essence, captures um, something about that, um, that kind of indescribable nature of what, what we feel when we feel pain. Um, and of course, pain has played a really interesting and um, complex role in society and culture, uh, you know, across the globe. Um, but from a neuroscience point of view, pain is also a real puzzle. And, you know, many people 
you know, didn't realize that when Penfield was mapping the cortex, um, you know, in, in, in a way, epilepsy patients, you never found a pain cortex. And even though now, you know, that's debated, maybe there are some regions of, in deep in the insula which you can induce uh, pain. When the imaging came along and people, you know, the whole brain lights up when you, when you give someone a pain stimulus in, in an fMRI scanner or a PET scanner, you, know, you can really see the kind of contrast there. Some, somehow, you know, it's all over the brain, but yet it's almost like nowhere in the brain. And then when you add that, you know, add in phenomenon like, you know, the phantom limb sensations where, you know, you get pain in, in a part of the body which isn't there, you kind of realize that there's something fascinating about pain. It's kind of, it's, you know, it's clearly subserved by some, um, um, you know, network that spans brain and spinal cord, but it's very hard to put your finger on what it is and where it is. Um, and in many ways, I think it's a much bigger puzzle, or much, you know, we understand much less about pain than we do many other, you know, aspects of, you know, sensation and motivation and so on. But I also want to argue that pain is a really interesting engineering problem. Because when you think about, you know, pain and what it does to us and how it helps us survive, you realize that it's at the very heart of self-preservation and our sense of autonomy. It's the border, you know, pain signals a border between you and the outside world. And it signals a border between you and the outside world in a way which is, you know, captures the threat uh, to your body and the threat to your life. Um, and, you know, if you think about, you know, what if you, you know, if someone said to you, okay, you've got to, you've got to build a pain system for a robot to go to an asteroid or Mars or whatever. Um, and you could say, well, that's probably quite a good idea because, you know, this robot's going to go off on its own and, um, and you know, who knows what it's going to find. It might find monsters or just cliffs or hot things. It's not a bad idea if it does actually have a pain system, but then how would you, you know, how would you design it? How would you build it? And that's a really, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and it's a very pertinent question because it really captures, you know, what do we actually mean by understanding pain? What level of understanding do we want? And if you think about, well, if I want... You know, if I if I genuinely think I understand a pain system, then I need to be able to kind of write down how I would actually design that system, how I actually think it's put together, and how I think it's built. And that is something which maybe that's an approach which will come up more in the in the following session about computational neuroscience. That I think Tim is leading, um, but here we can think about pain in that context. And in many ways, you think well, pain seems easier than many other problems like you know complex motor control or vision. Okay, so I'm going to now give you a bit of a history about how people have thought about pain. Um, and these are some, some of the really great names in, 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 in pain. And Ron Melzack, who's um, still alive, proposed this idea that pain was, you know, composed of three basic dimensions. There's a kind of sensory aspect, I kind of know where it is in my body. Um, an effective or motivational aspect, I kind of, I know I don't like it, and a cognitive point, a, a cognitive sort of evaluative perspective, which is like, okay, it, it kind of demands attention. So that's a kind of phenomenological approach, and that's that's been very influential in the thinking, particularly in imaging, how you might whether whether or how you might map those different dimensions to the brain. And then Bud Cray came along and said, "Okay, but you know, actually, we should think about pain as a homeostatic sense. You know, it's, it's pain is kind of has innate motivational value. It, it tells you about things which are bad for your physiological body." Um, that we should therefore think about it as an interoceptive, not an extraceptive uh, sense. And then uh, Howard Field says, oh, no, 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 let's think about it as a decision-making problem because pain is, you know, we predict pain. Pain you know, teaches us what not to do. It drives learning. It's a motivational signal. Um, and interestingly, it can modulate itself. So, it, it, you know, not only to determine our decisions, it kind of determines it's how much you feel your pain. And, you know, he was capturing the discovery, the fact that you, that the brain sends connections down to this dorsal horn where the pain, you know, the, the peripheral pain fibers come in and they can turn them up or turn them down. And then more recently, uh, Christian Buchelt, um, um, you know, building on our ideas at Bayesian brain and so on, said, oh, we should think about it um, as a statistical sensory inference implemented like in a, in a kind of Bayesian brain uh, architecture. Um, you know, and that, you know, argue that captures lots of things like expectancy effects and placebo effects and, and so on. Um, so that's, and that's interesting. And in many ways, all of those are, are kind of have, a, you know, a kind of right. Um, and they start to build a picture of how we understand pain. But there's still odd things like, you know, if pain is just a sensory inference, why is it modulated by so many things? And it's remarkable the extent to which pain is, is modulated. Um, 
so many emotional and motivational cognitive factors manipulate what we actually feel. And indeed, if it's kind of a nice sensory hierarchy, why is it, why does it have this you know, distributed representation? Why do we not have a nice you know, slab of you know, wedge of cortex devoted to, you know, to pain sensation? So there's still something we haven't captured, something of the mystery about pain, which we haven't captured but, but by, but by any of those on their own. So then, so let's think about it as an engineering problem then. Okay, um, so the thing about engineering and think about computational approaches is you've got to think about function. So, so stop thinking about what it feels like and start thinking about well, what does it do? And that, you know, then you start thinking about your robot. Okay, so the key therefore is I, I, you need to reduce harm um, and you need to reduce harm through learning. So then you think that that becomes like a minimization problem. And, and indeed what makes that problem quite difficult is something called a credit assignment problem. If you do a whole bunch of things in a row and you end up with pain, how do you know where you went wrong? So that's kind of like that little diagram at the bottom there. And a way of answering that and a very nice intuitive and simple way of answering that is to learn through trial and error. So if we assume that we have a system which can detect threat or could protect, uh, detect potential harm, then you can kind of, you have that signal and then you can learn through trial and error what things lead up to that. So we have natural rewards and we have natural punishments like pain. And if you just basically just store a value for, for any particular state you are in, like a place or any situation or a thing that you do, say how good or bad that thing is, um, um, then you can you know, assign a value to that. Then you can learn the values of everything using these prediction errors. And I'll just show you how that works. So values, you basically all you need to do for reinforcement learning is is, um, is um, have a signal which allows you to transfer values between different states. And that's called a prediction error. And the prediction error is kind of almost ubiquitous, ubiquitous in neuroscience as a way to do um, uh, kind of real learning. So if you do that, you can basically up, update a kind of tree or a, um, a sequence of things which lead to pain. And you can learn a map which looks something like that. So if you imagine that there's a reward there in the middle and pain at the end, you can see where you went wrong there. And you can use that to create a value map of the world so everything, you know, the part of the brain, which if you could imagine this would be thinking all the things have a certain chance of leading to pain and all the things which, which don't always lead to rewards and other things. And that's nice because you can use that for optimal responding and decision making and so on. But at least the question, does the brain actually do that? It's a nice idea. It actually links in very well with conventional theories in, in, ex, in experimental psychology and learning theory and the school of actor models and so on. Um, so we can design imaging tasks to look for evidence of that type of coding. And you take that prediction there, that's kind of the heart of the signal, the heart of the, the sort of model, the kind of the, the workhorse of the model. And we can do kind of simplified versions of those sorts of tasks where you have states leading to other states leading to pain or not to pain. And to cut a long story short, when you do that, yes, you can see something which looks very much like um, a prediction error. And that's encoded... Um, or correlates with activity um, in the ventral putamen in the basal ganglia. Very similar, in fact, to the area where you see reward prediction errors, suggesting that you know, there's a convergence of motivational and prediction error signals um, in the putamen um, and, and the rest of the basal ganglia. And indeed, that's a story which has been borne out. And to, to, again, to cut a long story short, we can, we can basically start looking at a whole range of different situations which capture these different, the different types of scenario um, um, that come into learning and decision making. So, if you learn for that relief from persistent pain, um, devaluation, avoidance learning, escape learning, how you solve things like exploration, exploitation dilemma, and different kind of types of decision like cognitive decisions or habit types decisions. And overall, um, and to spare you sh showing you like a bunch of papers, um, there's good behavioral and brain evidence the representation of something which looks like reinforcement learning values and, and prediction errors in the brain. Um, and, you know, that, but that then still leaves open the question because that's quite, you know, that's quite a nice idea of having pain as an objective signal for harm, but why is it modulated so much? And again, to cut a long story short, um, the story which is emerging is that in fact, what learning is, what, what the brain is doing is modulating the magnitude of a pain signal to optimize its value um, in decision-making. Because when you start having complicated situations like variable attention, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with differential controllability of the world when you start having when you start thinking about cognitive aspects of learning um, you realize that in fact it doesn't actually make sense to have a constant pain signal it makes sense to have an adaptive signal which you can upregulate or downregulate to maximize its actual efficiency um, during learning um, 
um, to kind of to kind of optimize the pain as a minimization problem, and that seems to be mediated through the descending and um, a control system. Um, so when you put all that together, you can start to build what we think looks like a map of the pain system in the brain. So if you see on the purple bit that goes up to the top, you have your kind of sensory and you know, nociceptive input. Um, and that is, you know, you, you, we can think about that in terms of a hierarchy going up through the this dorsal horn to the brainstem, subcortical structures and cortical structures. And that feeds into a hierarchy of control modules, which govern, you know, a very innate responses, you know, to dorsal horn level, to condition responses. So these are um, things like amygdala based autonomic responses, um, freezing, escape, res automatic escape from fight responses to what we think about as habit-based responding. So simple actions you do, rep you do repetitively if you face with the same situation over and over again, um, up to the more kind of cognitive aspects of decision making where you have an internal model of the world, how things lead together. So you can actually have a sort of a mental picture of that map and those representations. And all of those kind of control modules, they feed in both to influence the responses that we emit, that's the things that we physically do in the world, um, but also they can control the actual incoming input to, to optimize or maximize the, the safety and efficiency of that, of that system. So that kind of gives us a bit of an idea as to you know, a bit of insight into why in fact brain pain seems to be all over the brain because you, you, because you can appreciate the complexity of that sort of hierarchical um, system. And of course then you might say, well okay, you started off Ben by saying you know you, you, you know you want to think about doing this in robots and so on. Um, yeah, we can do that in robots and we can simulate that or we can put it in hardware um, uh, robots and that and you can actually show that by having a pain system that works very well indeed you can improve on conventional control systems for, or, you know, autonomous control systems um, um, very nicely by by having implementing systems that look like that so that pro you know provides some um, um, some reassurance that in fact you know what we're actually proposing does actually solve the problem very very effectively <clears throat> And kind of what I think, you know, a kind of a, a core point that I want to therefore convince you of that this moves us ahead in, in, in how we think about pain, because there have been often is a tendency to think about pain on the left hand view, a sensory, a sensory first view, which is where we think about pain as an optimal inference about the magnitude of a noxious event. Um, and in that context, we think about endogenous control you know, being modulated to meet various behavioral demands, so kind of add on things to help you in certain specific situations. But the key thing to realize is that really makes us, you know, that's really a, a retrospective view of pain. So what pain is system is basically telling you what just happened. Oh yes, I just received something noxious. That's what just happened. And I'm arguing in, instead pain might look a bit more like a, um, a motivation, a motivation or a control signal that, that that's actual primary function is to minimize future harm. And in that context, endogenous control is basically tuning pain to optimize your long-term future benefit to survival through learning. And that's a prospective view about pain. So that's what should I do? So what I argue that pain is not actually saying what happened, but it's telling you what do I need to do given this particular you know, ascending nociceptive input. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I will skip over this because basically enough people will probably convince you that pain is a really big problem from a clinical perspective. The question is, what do you, what do, you do about that? Um, I mean, the first thing is understanding why, and when you, when you, when you, you know, take a holistic view about all the things that contribute to the pathogenesis of pain, well, there's certainly factors that occur at the nociceptor, certainly factors that occur at the dorsal horn, but I think we, we also think that there are also factors that occur in the brain. And when you take that learning approach forward, um, you know, we can think about um, there being many ways in which Kind of oversensitive, if you like, uh, kind of overdoing it, pain system might lead to a state which prolongs the kind of normal adaptive response to a, to a to an injury or a, a, an insult. So there's a good case to be made that, if, that it's probably the case that in some pain conditions, if not all, there's a there's a extent to which abnormal learning or oversensitive learning might contribute to the gen to the generation of, of chronic pain. So then, okay, then apply that thinking to your, you know, all that kind of complicated hierarchical model, and you realize there's just a load of different parameters embedded within that learning system in the brain. And each of those is kind of doing different things. And the nice thing about thinking about this is that you realize that it's probably not going to be just one thing which is going wrong. It's probably, you know, a set of risk factors based on, on, on how, you know, how that, how that system is tuned. 
And there, you, when, you, when you think about it like that, you realize, oh, there's actually a lot of these things are shared between other people's models of depression or anxiety and so on. So you get an insight into, you know, a kind of shared risk factor model for the comorbidity that you get with chronic pain and other, um, other, other things like depression and anxiety. Um, so you can think about that as a kind of compute term, a kind of a set of risk factors which might play a role in any individual person or any individual condition. Um, based on that, and basically we can now therefore develop tasks to estimate what those parameters are, you can think about a kind of panel of different parameters which might mediate a risk factor to a risk profile for developing chronic pain. And we, in fact, when you actually do something like that, and we've been doing something like this in in rheumatoid arthritis, you can you start to see how some of these parameters really um, um, uh, are, are, are clearly different in people with chronic pain. Whether or not they're causative yet, is yet to be shown. So uh, last two slides, Rebecca. <laughs> um, so then the question, what do you do about that? Well, the nice thing about learning related pathologies is they speak to learning based interventions. So if you if you then conceive of, you know, understand your clinical problem, take your mechanistic understanding from neuroscience, and then start to think about how you can develop technologies to, to, to drive learning in a good way, then you can, you know, and then with the help of patients, you can hopefully come up with, with, with new treatment strategies. And that's what we've been doing a number of different ways of get, capturing that using imaging, using robot control, using AI type neurofeedback type paradigms and I won't go into the details other than to say that there's lots of room for innovation and creativity in designing new strategies and many of those do actually seem like they're going to work. That's the end. Thank you very much to people in my, in my lab here uh, and my key collaborators Tim in, in engineering, Helen in, in Brooks and Flav in, in Cambridge and I'll leave you with this nice image of the dreaming spires and you can decide where you think that's Oxford or not. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. It was lovely to um, hear your overview there. Um, in order to keep us to time for this long day, I won't take any questions um, at the moment. So we're now up. Um, next up is um, Professor Tipu Azee. Um, Tipu is a professor of neurosurgery and founder and head of the functional neurosurgery at Oxford. Um, his work played a pivotal role in the development of deep brain stimulation targets for Parkinson's disease. And in 2019, he was awarded the Medal of the Society of British Neurological Surgeons for his lifetime achievement in neurosurgery. So today, we're going to learn how neurosurgery can be used in the management of terminal cancer pain. Uh, let me just... Right. Well, uh, what I'd like to talk about is something that's uh, hardly ever uh, discussed really in clinical medicine, ablative surgery in the management of terminal cancer pain against a background where I've spent the last 30 years uh, treating uh, chronic uh, intractable pain syndromes with neuromodulation. And indeed, uh, Tim Dennison is working with us in treat, uh, developing a neurostimulator called Dynamo, as it, is, as it is, in the treatment of chronic post-stroke pain. But against that background, what I'd like to talk about is how neurosurgeons can manage terminal cancer pain. Now, the World Health uh, Organization has guidelines for treatment of cancer pain. And when patients at, at, at the top of the range of treatments, they're on opiates and quite a few other very powerful drugs. And yet, freedom from cancer pain does not come to all. In fact, it is still at unacceptable levels. If you look at the prevalence of cancer pain, 90% of patients with cancer will have pain. Between five and 30% will have intractable pain not covered by medical pain management. And we need to treat these people. It's important to maximize pain relief for ethical and economical reasons. It leads to lower rates of hospital readmissions and less interruption in treatment of their cancer therapy. The problem is, which I put to all of you, is that it is becoming a lost skill making lesions in the central nervous system to alleviate pain is a skill that is disappearing and very few people do it. 
And one of the reasons are that because people don't know what we can achieve, they don't refer to the patients. The advantages of lesional surgery are you get immediate benefit. You can do it fairly minimally and often under local anesthetic. It requires a very short hospital stay, maybe just a day, two days. You can perform it in very late stages of the disease. And you don't necessarily need to offer them any follow-up because if their pain is abated, if they're pain-free, they don't need to come back in their late stages of uh, the disease. And if the pain returns, we can make the lesion bigger. Now the topic, the lesions that are the targets I'll discuss are chordotomy, make a lesion in the spinal cord, myelotomy, splitting the cord, lesioning the entry zone of the sensory uh, nerve root, mesencephalotomy, which we do a lot of with front and nerve stimulation point of view, putting electrodes in the paraventricular gray with great effect. And one operation that I'm very fond of doing because of its efficacy is cingulotomy. Now these affect pain along different parts of the pathway, allowing for different targets. Depending on the patient's pain syndrome, you can attack pain from the sensory pathway, or you can attack it from the emotional side. Now chordotomy. Chordotomy is very good for unilateral pain like a, a, a pleural mesothelioma, breast cancer, brachial plexus pain, or unilateral leg pain. And what you do is, well, you can in the neck, just under local, go in for the side, put a radiofrequency electrode into the spinothalamic tract, stimulate to elucidate uh, paresthesia and heat the tip of the electrode up. And that alleviates pain. And lower down, you can do it through a very small exposure of the spinal um, cord. It, it does have complications. There's, uh, there aren't many publications on it. There's one case of a hemiparesis uh, reported. The other side effects are much more mild. Transient gait ataxia, transient positional headaches, contralateral pain for a few days after the procedure, uh, but mostly mild and well controlled. And that's a strange thing, this mirror pain. You get pain better doing one side and a pain-free mirror image arises on the other side of the body. There are two key papers, which I'll just quickly run through. There's that of Berger published in 2019. He actually had a quite a large number of 39 patients. And look at the clinical effects. 93% had immediate post-operative pain relief. And this was sustained in these terminal patients. And the complications were fairly acceptable. Then there's Vishwanathan's uh, paper from Houston. And that is the first randomized controlled trial of ablative procedures for pain. The numbers were small. There's six, uh, 16. Six of the, uh, of the seven patients were randomized to chordotomy and reached their primary outcome, which was a 33% reduction in pain relief. And then from the medical arm, seven patients went on to uh, uh, a chordotomy and all of them achieved useful pain relief. And the complications were fairly mild and acceptable. Myelotomy. Myelotomy is uh, where you expose the spinal cord and on the midline, precisely in the midline, pass needles at, um, across the midline to a depth of five millimeters and destroy the crossing fibers. And what it does do, it alleviates pain specifically of the viscera and pelvic pain. And there are again, two central papers. Hong and uh, Sandberg in 2007, they were able to show that doing myelotomies freed patients of opiates. And Vishwanathan also showed eight out of 11 people achieving successful pain relief, completely or significantly reduced. 
dorsal root ganglion entry, where the sensory uh, uh, nerve roots enter the spinal cord, you can put an electrode in there and destroy Lissauer's tract. And it has very little side effects and is very effective, but only at a very focal area of pain. The largest series was quite a long time ago, Sindhu in 1995 looked at nearly 370 cases of which 80 had cancer pain. And you can see from this that three quarters of the patients or even more obtained very useful pain relief. And the post median survival rate of these patients was 13 years. Of course, it's longer because not all of them were terminal cancer. And Texera in 2007 showed in a small series of radiation induced plexopathy that dorsal root uh, ganglion entry zone lesioning can help patients with again, acceptable complications. <clears throat> Mesencephalotomy, that's where what we would call largely the paraventricular gray area. And we've had over 20 years of implanting stimulators in this area for intractable benign pain. But you can also lesion it, particularly for head and neck intractable pain. <clears throat> but it can affect, given where it is, ocular motility and, and also cause paresthesia. It was introduced a long time ago by Spiegel and Vikas in 1947 after introduction of the stereotactic frame to clinical medicine. And they were able to report facial pain relief in a patient that lasted 18 years. So that was that paper. And then Raslan published a single case of a facial cancer and trigeminal pain without any complication and rapid onset of pain relief. Then you come to, the, I guess, my favorite target for intractable cancer pain, the cingulate, anterior cingulate gyrus. Now, it is very good for taking away the unpleasantness of pain. The interesting thing is surgery in this area doesn't make a difference too much of the pain, but it doesn't bother them anymore. And you do it uh, stereotactically, and uh, put lesions in the anterior cingulate. Stereotactic uh, procedures were first introduced in 62 in Mass uh, Massachusetts by Fultz and White. But cingulate as a target was first introduced in 1938 in Oxford by Hugh Cairns, doing it for pain and doing it through a craniotum. And the latest uh, paper from Israel is that of Berger in 2019. So here they are, again, describing these patients with extremely good uh, results. And the cingulate is very interesting that it is a very benign target. It's very hard to induce complications by lesioning, quite largely so in these areas. And we do them awake. Patients with terminal cancer come almost as a day case. We, they come in the morning, we do it, and they go home the next day. And this shows you the lesion of the anterior cingulate on both sides. And what I'd like to do is just briefly demonstrate to you what it does for a cancer patient. This is a gentleman with multiple vertebral mets and intractable pain for years. Yeah, if you tell me what uh, it was like. Yeah, the pain before the operation was uh, debilitating. Um, been in pain for five years. The operation itself was a little bit scary, but was okay, um, and the pain at the moment is zero. How bad was the pain before? Oh, it was horrible. It was life debilitating. All I could do was sit in a chair. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move around. But now, it seems to have gone. It worked to magic. So you're quite happy with it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, what is intractable pain and which patients qualify for this? Well, they shouldn't have any limitations or medical conflict indications to surgery. Targeted interventions like nerve blocks have failed. Best medical therapy 
as like the WHO recommendation has failed. Radiotherapy has been exhausted. And generally, we would take patients with limited life expectancy, about three months, um, uh, um, a predicted lifespan, though that's unpredictable. Although in benign pain, we, uh, there are reports of very long-term pain relief. In term, in, uh, generally, pain starts to return after 12 months, hence the limitation on life expectancy. If you use the right procedure, you can treat local pain by hitting the spinothalamic tract. A mesencephalotomy is good for head and neck pain. If you have pain below C5, you do a chordotomy. If you have visceral pain, you do a myelotomy. And if you have, like this gentleman I showed you, very diffuse pain, then what you do is do a singulotomy and take the emotional unpleasantness of the pain away. So in conclusion, I put to you, the ability to perform neuroablative procedures must not be lost to neurosurgery because it's effective, it's safe, it's easily tolerated by patients, the discharge time is fast, but it do does require a treatment uh, team working together, the palliative care physician, a neurosurgeon, and specialist pain nurses. And if anyone wanted references, I can pass them on. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And for those of you who are uh, pain clinicians and see patients with post-stroke pain, do pass them on because uh, Tim and I are starting this trial here in Oxford. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tipu. That was a lovely talk. And I'm sure many of us just hadn't realized how closely linked the treatment of cancer pain um, is to some neurosurgical approaches. Um, so the first question for you is, um, when you talk to your patients about these approaches to reducing cancer pain, um, are they surprised by the um, options that you're giving them? And do they resist or embrace these treatment approaches? Really, the, are those that I have... Uh treated have embraced the procedure. And what is surprising is how that option is not offered them probably more than 99% of the time when we can help them. Brilliant. So um, Dave Bennett has a question um, and he's saying it's great to see that um, this work being done and these randomized controls. And he's asking about um, the inclusion of shams and sham surgery. How do you um, deal with this in a randomized control trial design? I don't think you can do brain surgery as a sham. You can't uh, drill a hole in someone's head and uh, put a frame on and all that. You can do an on-off um, comparison, but a sham surgery, I don't think uh, is possible in functional neurosurgery. Fantastic. And there's a, another question um, from Tim Dennison. Um, and he is saying, do you see a role for the new laser ablation systems that are being applied for focal seizures? that I have strong feelings about introduction of extremely expensive lesional techniques for a, of a surgery that can be done with the simple radio frequency electrode. And I include laser amongst that. And I also include uh, uh, MR guided ultrasound lesioning because what they're doing, and Tim may totally disagree, is converting a very cheap, easily done procedure to something that's wildly expensive. That's really interesting perspective. So I also um, have a question for you, and it's around how trying to link up some of what you've been telling us about the treatment of pain in these patients with um, what Ben was telling us about these complex models and how pa pain can't be isolated. So when you do your um, singulotomy um, approach, how does that um, embrace some of the concepts that Ben addressed around pain being all over the brain and not being able to be localized? Yeah, it crosses over to a lot of what he says. Um, and particularly if you look at patients who've had cingulate surgery, be it uh, neuromodulation or lesional surgery, because the pain is still there, you know, but it doesn't bother them. It's quite a phenomenal thing. And some patients say that the, they feel as if the pain is there, but not in their body. So yeah, it, it, it may be explained by some of what Ben's been saying. 
Well, that's fantastic. So thank you very much. And thank you for all the um, great questions that are coming in. Certainly, um, I encourage you to keep asking questions so that we can make this as interactive as possible. So now it's time for the exciting flash talk session um, in this pain um, part of the symposium. And I think um, Nick primarily designed this to keep the chairs on their toes. Um, but in addition, it's going to give us a broad sense of some of the different work that's being done from some of our more junior colleagues. So do um, give them the opportunity to answer your questions afterwards. So now I'm going to hand over to Justine Holmgren. He works with Katie Warnerby, and he's going to tell us all about assessing pain perception under general anaesthesia. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Pleasure. Uh, so my project is about how anaesthesia affects pain perception. So we uh, general anaesthesia is used uh, chiefly to prevent uh, awareness of pain during surgery. Uh, oh, apologies. And uh, the, we know that the thalamus is a key region, both in the mechanisms of general anesthesia, as well as in uh, pain processing. In a previous study in our lab, we identified a brain state under general anesthesia that we call SWOS, which is characterized by maximum slow waves. And in this brain state, the thalamocortical system becomes isolated from external stimulation. And crucially, this happens well past the point where people become unresponsive. However, in this study, people reached this state at different concentrations of anesthesia, but were taken in the end to the same effect site concentration. So some people were only just there, and other people would have been taken well past the point. So uh, in the current study, what we wanted to do was see if we targeted this SWAT state specifically and titrated it to it, how would, that, uh, how would the, pain, uh, the brain look when it's subjected to pain, as well as how would the thalamocortical system be altered? To investigate this, we uh, recorded uh, fMRI during pain and auditory stimulation, as well as during rest, when people were awake and in this was state. Uh, we also collected perfusion imaging in the same states. Uh, the pain simulation involved heat pain calibrated to the individual, and it was followed by an auditory prompt to uh, respond by squeezing their hand. Uh, in order to know that we were actually at SWOT, we titrated the anesthesia according to individual brain activity. And specifically, we modeled slow wave power as a function of the anesthetic concentration in order to get to this uh, plateau that we call SWOT, and crucially to minimize the overshoot past it. Now, we know that anesthesia profoundly affects uh, the general physiology. And indeed, we do find that uh, cerebral blood perfusion was significantly elevated in the SWOT state compared to wakefulness. So we took that change in cerebral blood perfusion and used it as a covariate in our following analyses for stimulus evoked bold signal change, as well as change in the thalamocortical functional connectivity. So first of all, we find that no participants were responsive at spots to either pain or to auditory stimulation. And when we looked at how the brain responded, we see stereotypical activation maps for pain and for auditory stimulation when they were awake, but at SWOS, there was no significant activation whatsoever. And indeed, when we do the formal comparison between the two conditions, we see a significant reduction in all the relevant pain and auditory regions. So this indicates clearly that SWOS is a state where normal sensory processing, including of pain, is severely disrupted. Moving on to the thalamocortical uh, analyses, what we did was that we segmented the thalamus uh, using diffusion imaging into subregions and then looked at the functional connectivity between those subregions and its cortical, uh, corresponding cortical target. And we found that uh, uh, there was significantly reduced functional connectivity at SWAS compared to wakefulness for, for uh, several cortical regions, uh, all of them involved in pain. And this indicates that there is some level of thalamocortical functional uh, disruption at SWAS. And altogether, this indicates that anesthesia induces disruption of pain processing and that this is accompanied by a breakdown in thalamocortical connectivity. Thank you very much. Um, that was brilliant and I'm incredibly impressed how much information you managed to get in such a coherent way into such a um, brief talk. Um, so my question for you is, obviously some of these SWAS measures have the real potential to be used in the clinical setting. How do you um, approach taking this um, scientific body of work into um, a clinical environment? So one of the projects that we are working on that's not uh, part of my, uh, my DPhil 
is to actually apply this, this uh, translationally. So we have uh, a project starting up in New Zealand soon where we will be uh, developing a uh, real-time uh, titration system to get to SWOT and uh, to do this in around 300 patients to see if this is actually uh, feasible to, to use clinically and, and on, a, on a large scale. Thank you very much. So um, next we have the pleasure of listening to Maria Kobo um, from my lab and to tell us about some work which is about to be published in one of my favourite journals, eLife, um, in the next week or two. Um, she obtained her first degree from Ecuador in biotechnology and has an MSc in clinical trials and stratified medicine um, from the University of Glasgow. So um, Maria is now going to tell us about improving the measurement of neonatal pain. Thank you, Rebecca. Can you see my screen there? Yes, we can see your screen. Brilliant, thanks. So I moved to Oxford three years ago to start my day field involving investigating how neonates feel pain. And having no clinical background, it struck me to learn that one in seven babies born in the UK need specialized care required to be hospitalized. And during this critical developmental period, they can experience 10 different painful procedures per day on average. There is plenty of evidence suggesting that there is a relationship between early exposure to pain in early life and then changes in uh, central function, poor cognitive and behavioral development later in life and from a school age. Now, pain management varies a lot across different places and many babies still do not receive appropriate analgesia. Then we can ask, why is this the case? While pain is a subjective experience, very difficult to assess in non-verbal patients and relying in behavioral scales which lack specificity for, for pain is definitely problematic. Researchers in Oxford have developed a new way which can be an objective proxy measure by looking at EEG brain activity and identified an evoked potential with a specific pattern with maximum amplitudes at the vertex after a blood test and with very small amplitudes following other non-painful stimulus like auditory or tactile. This measure has been further validated across different body locations and modalities, which makes it an excellent candidate to be used as an outcome in clinical trials. My investigation then focused on testing in a pilot study one of the most common analgesics, which is paracetamol, for which there is mixed data and everything suggesting there is no, that it is not effective to manage acute pain in babies. However, I studied a group of babies born prematurely who needed immunizations. One group of babies did not receive paracetamol and the other received paracetamol one hour before the procedure. By using this EEG derived measure, I found that actually babies receiving paracetamol had a reduced noxious about brain activity to immunizations. These pilot results can help us now to develop a randomized controlled trial and test these analgesic, which currently is only licensed to be used above three months of age. Now, conducting clinical trials in this vulnerable population has challenges from the ethical and practical point of view, and every effort should be made to minimize the number of babies that are needed that are also going to be exposed to potential side effects. For this purpose, we developed a baseline sensitivity paradigm where we observed that their response to a mild noxious stimulus, which does not pierce the skin or distress the baby, is related to the individual response to a acute procedure like a blood test. We can use this then to account for the variance that we observe in individual infants to increase the power to observe a true effect. In this case, we tested with gentle touch of the leg before the blood test. And based on this, we developed a paradigm that can be used um, to improve the way that we design and test analgesics in this population and ultimately to improve everyday clinical practice in neonatal units. I'm very grateful to this exceptional team that I been, have had the pleasure to work with and thanks to everyone for your attention.
Thank you very much, Maria. Um, and so um, one question to you. You've said that you think this approach can be used in order to reduce sample sizes because there's a relationship between applying a mild noxious stimulus before an actual clinical event with the way that the baby responds to the actual procedure. How generalizable is that across um, different babies or infants or populations? And, and can it actually be used more generally to assess um, sort of the sensitivity evoked by these procedures? Definitely. Um, there is research going on in our lab where we are taking the basis on these findings that I have briefly described and uh, similar methodologies can be used to identify specific patterns in a broad age range from very premature young babies to older babies. We have also validated this when procedures are not only performed in the foot, like a heel lens, but also cannulations, injections in the thigh. And there is definitely a lot of potential to be, uh, to be developed as a tool, for example, to be used in clinical practice, not only to measure pain or diagnose pain during these minor procedures, but having this model of having a baseline sensitivity measure can give us an idea, for example, of how sensitive is a baby after postoperative pain or uh, before having a more complex procedure to, at the individual level, be able to really manage every patient in the best way, having the most reliable objective measure like this one. You've got a few questions coming in, so perhaps you could just try and answer these ones really quickly to, so we can cover a couple of different topics here. Um, Oliver Braddock and Jan Atkinson are interested in how old the babies were in the study. So the study uh, we did with paracetamol babies have reached term age, so they were postmenstrual age around 37 weeks, but had been born uh, prematurely from 28 weeks uh, on average. And Ian... And Sorry. Sorry, and for the um, study where we test uh, gentle touch, um, babies all, all babies were term. And um, Ian Dong is asking um, whether um, admission to the neonatal intensive care unit increases risk for mental health problems later in life. Um, I'm not that familiar with mental health problems specifically, but definitely um, at this developmental stage, the way the this disrupts um, the development has been shown particularly a propensity to develop chronic pain, for example, later to have altered uh, pain thresholds. And of course, it's all an integrated system that uh, can be well correlated or related also to more psychological effects um, later in life. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Maria. Thank so you. Finally, we're over to John Dawes, and he's going to tell us all about autoantibodies and pain. Um, I'm going to warmly congratulate him on his relatively new MRC New Investigator Research Grant with um, Professor Dennett's Neural Injury Group. So hopefully now we're going to end um, the session on a high um, with John. Cool. Thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to talk. So it's fairly well accepted that the immune system has a role in chronic pain, but one uh, arm of this response, uh, which is probably even less well studied, is that of autoimmunity, and particularly the role of autoantibodies. Now I've been studying samples from patients who have uh, a range of neurological conditions secondary to autoantibodies directed against proteins which interact with the voltage-gated testing channels. Now, neuropathic pain is common in these patients. It can be the sole presenting symptom, and interestingly, uh, pain can be relieved with immunotherapy. Now we know that um, hyperexcitability within primary sensory neurons within the DRG can be a key driver of neuropathic pain and that the potassium channels involved here are known to act as a break on sensory neuron excitability. And therefore I want to use these samples to not only understand their pathogenicity, but to also try and identify kind of clinically relevant uh, pathways that might regulate sensory neuron excitability and be applicable to neuropathic pain more generally. Now my previous work has focused on Caspar 2 uh, one of these targets, but today I'm going to talk about more recent work looking at another one of these targets, LGI-1, uh, which has not yet been studied in the context of pain. Now, LGI-1 is distinct from these other autoantibody targets in that it's uh, a secreted protein and it's thought to bind extracellularly to kind of stabilize this complex within the cell membrane. 
uh, is, it has a known role uh, in regulating excitability within the central nervous system, both in terms of synaptic transmission, as well as regulating intrinsic neural excitability, but has not really been studied uh, for a role in the peripheral nervous system. However, it turns out that actually LGI1 is very highly expressed by these primary sensory neurons. So here, this is some images from the mouse DRG sections. At the top here, um, it's just new end to kind of mark um, as a panneural marker. And at the bottom in red, these are in situ probes, or in green, this is um, antibodies against LGI1, showing that indeed this, this protein is uh, highly expressed by these neurons. And this is in line with some recent RNA-seq data showing actually that LGI1 is very highly expressed um, by subsets of nociceptors, suggesting that these could be the uh, target of these antibodies uh, in these patients to cause pain. Now, in line with this idea, um, I have injected um, theorem um, from LGI1 antibody patients or from healthy controls into um, the pore of mice. Um, and then you can kind of test that area for how sensitive it is using uh, monofilaments or von Frey hairs, which can apply a different amount of force uh, to the plantar hindpore and looking for a, a reflex withdrawal response as a measure of pain uh, sensitivity. And on the right here, I just show the behavior data, showing that, um, that in those mice that received the serum from the LGO1 antibody patient, um, following that, that injection, um, they had a significant reduction in, in their pain thresholds versus control suggesting that they have now become, um, they have increased pain sensitivity. And likewise, actually, uh, we've taken another approach here using uh, genetic ablation. And what I've done here is um, you can use a specific uh, transgenic approach to specifically ablate LJ1 just in um, primary sensory neurons. Uh, and then using the same behavioral assay, um, what you can, what you see is that um, in those mice where LJ1 has been genetically removed, uh, again, they feel that they, um, they are kind of hypersensitive versus uh, control mice. <clears throat> so in summary, kind of previous and current work has shown that these antibodies uh, seem to be pathogenic in terms of pain, but also that you can use these to identify kind of novel regulators potentially impacting on sensory neuro neural function and uh, pain sensitivity. And then potentially that this opens up kind of new avenues um, for future uh, therapies that might be applicable to neuropathic pain more generally. So yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone who's, who's helped out with this work. As expected, that was a brilliant way to end this session. The one question I have for you is, um, now that you've um, seen that LGI-1 does lead to pain hypersensitivity, what are you going to do next? Yeah, so, that, so there's, a, there's a few things to do. I mean, um, one is to, to obviously kind of look at mechanistically. So um, I'm yet to kind of have a look at whether that does actually kind of impact on um, uh, excitability of neurons through um, the impact on the KB1 channel. So that's kind of one uh, area to look at. But also, as I mentioned there, to maybe kind of have a look at this being an approach to kind of treat pain. So the idea being that obviously, if you kind of lost the function of LGI1, a kind of increased pain sensitivity, and then maybe if you kind of give that uh, protein, maybe you can kind of treat pain. So it's a secreted protein. So whether you can kind of give that protein in some of our neuropathic pain models to see if you can kind of impact um, therapeutically on, the, on that pain. And one question from Angela Vincent, is IGI-1 in the same neurons as Casper 2 Yeah, the, the, that's, a, that's a great question. So actually from the, the RNA um, seq data that, that's come out, actually, it seems that they're, they're in quite distinct uh, neuronal populations and that um, kind of LGI1 being quite highly expressed in a, in a kind of subset of nociceptors which don't seem to express uh, Caspar 2 as much. So it's kind of quite interesting to, to kind of look at these two different kind of targets and, and maybe you can kind of pull out some kind of distinct mechanisms. Thank you. So um, thank you to all the speakers for presenting your work so succinctly and elegantly. It made my job as chair incredibly easy. So